Well, I have a lot to get to for you guys, so grab your Bibles, fasten your seatbelt, and let's pray. Father in heaven, we just acknowledge first your, your power, God, that you are the creator of the universe, that everything in it was made by the word of your power. God, we acknowledge your presence with us in this room. God, that your loving, holy, and fatherly gaze rests upon each of us here tonight. And I ask, we ask that your Holy Spirit, Lord, by your supernatural power and grace, would soften our hearts that we may behold wondrous things from your word and be transformed. All for your son's name's sake, amen. To begin, I'll read a few lines in an article from the World Health Organization. It says, with working long hours now known to be responsible for about one-third of the total estimated work-related burden of disease, the study concludes that working 55 or more hours per week is associated with an estimated 35% higher risk of stroke and 17% higher risk of dying from is ischemic heart disease compared to working 35 to 40 hours a week. And our passage tonight is about work and wisdom. A cute and simple definition for wisdom is this, the ability to apply spiritual truth to life's circumstances. And so we'll explore that topic under three headings, wisdom for work, wisdom's weakness, and wisdom's whisper. Wisdom for work. The teacher says in Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6, better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after the wind. Notice three details. First, Solomon's topic is work. This means your employment, your roles and responsibilities. Number two, Solomon assumes there are many different ways to approach your work, as we'll see in the passage. Detail three, Solomon suggests that his way is wiser. And I want you to notice two points and a principle. <laughs> to be wise, should be up there, to be wise is to have one handful instead of two. Because doing too many things and taking on too many responsibilities works against you and to some degree prevents you from enjoying any of them. See, notice how in the verse when you work with one handful, your hand is filled with quietness, which means peace, rest, contentment. And also notice that when you get the other hand involved and begin to fill both hands, all of a sudden they are both filled with work and toil, a striving after the wind. The point is do not work so much that you forfeit rest. Because if you forfeit rest, over time you will simultaneously forfeit joy. The second point to notice is the teacher Solomon in the original Hebrew language used two different words for handful and hands full. The word used for handful is kaf, which means palm, hollow or flat of the hand. The word used for hands full is hofen, which means fists. And the teacher intentionally does this so that we would understand the difference in demeanor, the importance of our posture toward our work in the world. The wise approach to work, and actually to our entire lives, is with an open hand, palm up, willing to give in such a way that it actually affects how much you can carry. You have one hand's worth as opposed to two. Our posture towards God should be willingness to give up ourselves and to receive from God, not two fists distrustfully clenching for things. The principle is wisdom turns away from neglecting rest. But as we transition, wisdom also turns away from resting too much. 
as you see here in verse 5. It says, the fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. The teacher again uses a different Hebrew word, now a third one, for the hands of a lazy person. The word is yad, which means from not yah, yad, which is from the fingertips down to the elbow. And the idea is that the lazy person folds his yod, so it's doing this, meaning he's not using his strengths. This is the same Hebrew word yod that's used to describe the mighty Samson when his yod were tied closed and he could not use his strength. The point is that wisdom and laziness do not get along, and so do not fold your yod. Our second main heading and where we'll spend the most of the time is wisdom's weakness. Has anyone, raise a hand, has anyone ever heard the quote, easier said than done? Has anyone ever heard that? Okay, I think a lot of people that's, yeah, should have heard that. This is true for wisdom. This is true for wisdom. You can know, okay, I need to rest. You can know I shouldn't overwork. Or you can know I shouldn't be lazy but it's easier said than done. So, wisdom's kryptonite. Does anyone here not know what I'm talking about when I say kryptonite? All right, so Superman, kryptonite, they're against each other. Wisdom's kryptonite is the sin that liveth in us. Flip with me back to Ecclesiastes chapter four, starting in verse four. Then I saw all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. In verses seven and eight, again I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for who am I toiling and depriving of myself, excuse me, depriving myself of pleasure? This is also, excuse me again, this is this, my goodness, this, is also, this also is vanity. My goodness me, speaking is vanity. All right. This is also, my goodness, this is like a fifth time. I just got a typo. I just got to admit it. Is, it. is it up there too? This is, this also, oh. Do not use the dictation. We'll get you in big trouble. Okay. So I want to look this up. I don't want to get it wrong. I, what it essentially says is this also is vanity and unhappy business. (laughs) Oh, Lord, help us. Lord. All right. (laughs) So Solomon makes clear that our sin, that our sin is wisdom's kryptonite. Trying to apply God's truth to our lives, sin is the kryptonite to our wisdom. And so let's, Look deeper. What is the envy in this passage? What is the envy that he says, generally speaking, the work done under the sun is out of envy of our neighbors? What is the envy? Envy has an outward focus. We desire some item, person, attribute, or any other thing possessed by someone else, and we are dissatisfied in not having it. Where did envy come from? Envy began with Adam and Eve in the garden. Eve wanted what God possessed, which was what? The knowledge of good and evil, and was dissatisfied in not having it. Adam and Eve reached out and took the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and all mankind in that moment fell from God, and God cursed the ground, if you remember of which we work. Genesis 3, starting at verse 17. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, God is speaking to Adam, and have eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field, By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. To say that you'll work for everything you get. 
This is where envy began. Okay, so what does envy produce? Flip with me to the classic story of Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter four, starting in verse one. Now Adam and Eve, my goodness, again. Adam knew Eve, his wife. That means sex. She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Amen, sisters? I honestly, I don't even think that that's what that means, but it's funny. Um, And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Envy. And in fact, all sin produce destruction of life. Cain killed his own brother, Abel. Abel was a real human being with real thoughts and feelings. And Cain abruptly ended his life in cold blood. It doesn't sit well. His life was so short-lived. And it feels so off. This unsettling and ominous sense of offness about Cain, Cain's or Abel's life effectively captures what is meant by the word vanity. a theme, a major theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. And in fact, the Hebrew word for vanity is hevel, like we've mentioned every other week, hevel. And this word hevel is derived from the name in the story of Abel. It's the same, same thing, Abel, hevel. It's where he got the term. Everything under the sun is Abel. So how do we gain power over our sin, which includes envy? So that we may apply wisdom to our work. It's like when your sink is backed up or the whole, you know, all the pipes in your home. For those of you who know my house, I've not lived in for two weeks uh, because of the pipes backed up. So this hits home. This hits home. What I've learned And what we can, a principle to take away is that, yes, the water backing up in the sink is a problem. But the deeper problem from which the problem came, you have to trace back. You have to find the source of the problem. So what is the source of Cain's envy? Verse 4 and 5 say, And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry. And to understand this story, you have to understand that at some point, God had communicated the necessity for them to bring a sacrifice to God. Cain's sacrifice was unacceptable to God because it was not a righteous sacrifice. So it was invalid, and therefore Cain himself was no longer acceptable by God, like Abel was. This is the source of Cain's envy, and in fact, is the source of all sin, the loss of complete and utter acceptance with God. 
Because if you possess complete and irrevocable acceptance with God Almighty, you have everything. This is what is meant by that song lyric that many of you know, Jesus, you are enough for me. With nothing, I still have everything. Jesus, you are enough for me. So where do we go for acceptance with God? Where do we go to get this acceptance that Cain did not have, that Abel did have? Well, God sent us a new and greater Abel. He is greater because, yes, the first Abel sacrifice was sufficient to take the place of the death that Abel deserved for his sins against God. But Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient to take the place of the death that every single person deserves. Why? Because the blood shed at the cross of Christ was not the blood of one animal which temporarily covered the death that one man deserved, but rather at the cross of Christ, the blood shed was the blood of the infinite God whose death is able to cover the death deserved by an infinite number of people. This is why all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thought exercise. I want you to picture the person or the people that you care about the most in this life. Imagine that at the end of your life, you come to find out that that person had not received Jesus Christ. And imagine that God gave you a piece of paper and said that if you sign that paper, you would switch spots with that person. You would go to hell forever and ever and ever. You will have been there away from the presence of God in heaven for a trillion years and not be one moment closer to getting out. Experiencing the full penalty of sin against God. Would you sign on the dotted line for that person? Would you really take their place? It's forever. It's the full penalty of sin. If really presented with that option, would you do it? Christ is the greater brother because he did sign on that dotted line. He gave up the treasures and comforts of being the exalted God almighty over the heavens. And he left this behind. He gave it up because he'd rather have you. Philippians 2, 6 through 8, speaking of Jesus Christ, says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Imagine that Cain found out that Abel was offering his sacrifice for Cain. Imagine Cain finds out that Abel actually went to go offer that sacrifice for him, for Cain. And imagine that God told Abel the required sacrifice was his own life. And Abel agreed for his brother, his brother Cain. He saw Cain's anger, that Cain was distraught and confused. He saw Cain's brokenness and emptiness. He saw Cain's need. He loved his brother. Imagine Abel died for Cain in his place. And then there would be two ways for Cain to respond to his brother's death. He could respond with heartbreak and grief, humbly, to accept his brother's love and sacrifice, which would completely transform every aspect of his life. Every joy would increase Cain's appreciation 
for his brother Abel. That it's only made possible because of him. And every pain would be put in perspective. Or Cain could be hard-hearted and proud. Refuse to really look at what his brother did. And any time he feels tempted to consider his brother's love, to contemplate his brother's love, he'll distract himself and try to snap himself out of it. I don't want to look at that. So how are you responding to Christ's love? Because only after you receive what Christ has done will your work be put in the right perspective. And will you have the power over the sin that's living in us? So the kryptonite to wisdom is sin. But sin loses its power through Christ. And in him we are made wise. Now on to wisdom's second weakness. Final weakness. Weakness number two. Wisdom leaves us dissatisfied. And what I mean by wisdom's weakness here is Even if we gain power over the sin in us through Christ and we are able to apply this wisdom for how to approach work with our lives and we do end up finding great success, the end is still unfulfillment and dissatisfaction. Ecclesiastes 4, starting in verse 13. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he the poor wise youth, went from prison to the throne. Though in his own kingdom he had been born poor, I saw all the living who move about under the sun along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity in striving after the wind. The first point To notice, the application of wisdom in this life is extremely valuable. See, even a random, poor delinquent can build great success and find himself in places of great popularity and influence. It would be like a random delinquent from, say, Tampa, without even a cell phone, becoming wise and ending up taking Elon Musk's position as the most rich and powerful person on earth. Robbie. (laughs) If anyone has a cell phone they'd like to sell to Robbie, um, let me know. No, I'm kidding. He's got one now. He's got one. We replaced it. It dropped in like the 100-foot pond in the middle of the fall conference. Robbie's phone. So wisdom is extremely valuable. The second point is that popularity is fleeting. You can be standing in front of a lot of people, in front of a lot of people being a leader, being in a place of influence, but one day you will be replaced. I'm thinking of a person who stood in this exact place, well, teaching at midweek, 10 years ago and was very popular, highly praised for his wisdom, rightfully so, I'd like to add. Some of you know who I'm talking about, but many of you don't even know his name. So if you think you know his name, let's say it. Three, two, one, Jake Van Sickle. Yeah. This guy would put my teaching to shame. Even if he didn't prepare. (laughs) But many of you have no idea who that is. So popularity is fleeting. That's why the teacher says there was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity. Okay, third point. Wisdom is limited in what it offers us and is ultimately unable to satisfy our deepest longing. The teacher says it plainly back in chapter 2, starting in verse 14. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life 
because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. For all is vanity and a striving after the wind. And this says that even if you know wisdom and you apply wisdom to how you approach your work, you will still experience this deep sense of vanity so that even wisdom itself is able, short-lived, unsettled, ominous feeling of offness at the end of it. And so why is this? Wisdom is vanity. Well, our third and final heading, wisdom's whisper. Wisdom whispers the curse. A theme of the book of Ecclesiastes is that we are under the sun. This phrase, under the sun, is designed to remind us of the curse. Remember what God said to Adam? You will eat by the sweat of your brow. So the the picture is a man working in the sun, under the heat of the sun, the curse. The big idea is that even being able to apply maximum wisdom to our life now still carries with it the reality that we're still under the curse. So wisdom whispers. Curse. Kind of creepy, sorry, but... And what do we do with that? I don't know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you'll, see, you'll see in a second, I think, I hope. Okay, second. What? Wisdom whispers the cry. The whole book, Solomon despairingly says, there is nothing new under the sun. He is longing for something new. And there's nothing here, he says. I've tried everything. All the riches and the pleasures, every experience, there is nothing here under the curse that can satisfy something in me. Deep, 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 deep down in the deepest corridors of my being, he is longing for something new. Jesus came and he said, I am here to make all things new. Jesus destroyed that curse on the cross by becoming the curse for us. Jesus heard the cry of wisdom. And through him, we approach our life's work with wisdom. Because in him, we have the hope of the new creation. And this transforms everything, including our work. Every single thing is transformed. It certainly transforms our work. Because now, because of the new creation, when all things are made new, the things you do, the work, actually has eternal meaning. And if you apply maximum wisdom to your life, and you have great achievements, and you you do great things, and have wonderful success, knowing Christ infuses joy into that too. Because it's only a dull, dull, dull foretaste of what is to come. And when you have Christ, the greatest thing on earth, the greatest pleasure, the greatest achievement, everything the human longs for, we get to be reminded that it is a very, very dull, like 0.0001% or it's less than that of the, of the, the pure enjoyment of what is to come. The Bible says, no eye has seen nor ear heard the things that God has in store for us. He says, in my right hand are pleasures forevermore. The infinite God has infinite joy to give. And this transforms our despair. 
you apply wisdom or you suck at applying wisdom. Either way, it's like in the end, the greatest despair, or if it's by circumstance, whatever it is, the worst possible thing that humans can go through on the earth, the deepest, darkest things that we see in the earth or that we will face in our lives. If we have Christ, every time you go through that, you are reminded that it's almost over and that we're all living in a nightmare and it's almost, we're, almost gonna, we're, we're about to wake up. So he infuses joy into everything. The greatest despair reminds us of our glory every time. The greatest despair, the worst despair, reminds us of our, of our glorious, of the glorious new creation. Jesus is the wisdom of God. And through him, every aspect of our lives' work is transformed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, just thank you for your holy word. Father, I just pray that um, you would bring to bear the truths and realities of your word onto every single one of us here. Lord, and that any who, like Cain, um, reject you, I pray that, that, Lord, you would just soften their heart and change them to just see your sacrifice, to see what you did for us, to just embrace you. Lord, and for those who do know you, help us to embrace you more, Lord, and to see our work through you, through um, what, what you're doing to make all things new. God, transform us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.